Hello, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic, where today we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to do a sort of game show style uh, episode, uh, where quite often we get um, we get sent positions from Sudokus that uh, that you've got to, and you ask us to sort of help you out with the next number. Now we get a lot of these requests, and we can't deal with all of them. But sometimes, if I have a few minutes, I'll just take some time and have a stare and see if I can see anything. And I've had uh, three recently, which were very, very interesting positions, um, and I thought we might we might work through them uh, today. Now, the other thing I just want to mention before we kick off is thank you very much to the guys on or the viewers who've pointed me in the direction of the new version of Duncan's Sudoku Solver, which is um, it's the preferred user interface that I use for videos on the channel, and I love it because I can enter these um, small digits in cells very easily and Duncan Nightingale whose software this is has produced a new version out this month that allows me to flick between big numbers and little numbers just by pressing the right mouse button now this is an absolute godsend thank you Duncan for that this is really um, it's going to I think it's going to make viewing the videos a more pleasurable experience because you won't see me flicking between these numbers all the time um, but yeah big big fan of this software so um, this is great um, just one more thing as well, if you, any of you are in a position to sponsor us on Patreon, please would you consider it, that would be really appreciated. Uh, two, two bucks a month uh, gets you our monthly puzzle, and three bucks a month gets you a video as well on how to solve the puzzle. Um, anyone who's in a position to give us any help, would be, uh, we'd be delighted, obviously. Right, now let's take a look at this one to start with. Now, oh, going through the three the three puzzles I want to look at, I wasn't sure in which order to present them in that they're all not easy, I will tell you that. So do take a stare at the grid. This is exactly how it's presented to me. Um, and the way I eventually managed to back into this one was to look for um, a certain type of an X-wing. So I'll tell you that that's what you're looking for. Do pause the video, have a stare at it, see if you can see. I'll tell you, it's not a straightforward X-Wing, this one. It's a so-called sashimi X-Wing. And this one is even a sashimi finned X-Wing. So it is fairly brutal. Now, I'll add some highlighting afterwards. But you may say, well, how do you go about spotting sashimi finned X-Wings? Well, the first thing we have to remember when we're spotting X-Wings is we're always looking for a number that is restricted in a row or column to exactly two positions. That will always be the base. There will always have to be one row or column that that is true for. Now, in a in a basic X-wing pattern, there'll actually have to be two rows or columns that that's 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 true for. But in any um, in any X-wing, a sashimi X-wing, finned X-wing, there must be one column that is limited to just two positions. Now, if we have a look at row eight here, and we think about the number. Uh, the number, what should we look at actually, we'll look at the number 8 in this in this row. Um, what can we see about where the number 8 can go? Now obviously it can only go in exactly two positions, these two positions. So once we spot this, and it's true of the number 5 as well, we can, we can shuffle up the grid and try and find other rows where the, the 8s or the 5s suffer or benefit from a similar restriction. And here, there's something interesting going on in, this, in row 4, where the 5s and the 8s are actually limited to three positions, but in this position, they marry up with the column uh, in, in row 8. So we've got a 5 or an 8 in this square, and then shuffling across in this square, which would be the classic X-wing, if we had a five, if the only place a five or an eight could go in row four was in this square, we would have the classic X-wing. But here we don't have that. Indeed, we have a two in this square. So we don't quite have an ordinary X-wing. But what we do have is a situation where we can, we can identify that there are only two possible states of existence when we look now at this block. Either this square here will be a 5 or an 8, or, and if that's true, if there is a 5 or an 8 in this square, what we know 
is that there, there won't be that number in this square here. Yeah. Now, if that is not true, if this is not a 5 or an 8, then what, what happens? We know that the number we're looking at will have to be in this square. There will have to be a 5 or an 8 in this position. So let's just imagine we're looking purely at 5s at the moment and we've decided that this is not a 5. This will be a 5. Now there won't be a 5 in this square. So now when we look at this central 3x3 three three block, we know one of these 5s will have to be true. So in this situation, what we'd be able to say is when looking at this square, there is no way this can be a 5. And ditto, there's no way it can be an 8 either, for exactly the same reason. We have a sashimi fin x-wing on both the numbers 5 and 8 here. And in fact, therefore, this square has to be a 1. So that is, is quite an unusual pattern. I mean, it's, a, it's unusual enough to see a sashimi fin x-wing. It's very unusual to see it working for two different numbers. But I think that that, that is the case here. If this Let's just go through it once more so that we're all comfortable. Let's just focus now on 8s instead. If this is an 8, we know that this square cannot be an 8. So let's ask the question, what happens if this is not an 8? If this is not an 8, we need to put an 8 somewhere in row 8. So it's going to have to be here. Now if this is an 8, this square here cannot be an 8. And we need to put an 8 somewhere in row 4. So it must be in one of these two positions now. So either the fins are true or this is true. We can eliminate the 8 and the 5. By identical logic, this square here will have to be a 1. You can see that immediately tidies up the puzzle and it becomes trivial from that point forward. So that's question 1. Now, let's have a look at Sudoku number 2. And here we go. This was sent in by Melvin. And um, I let Melvin down, to be honest here, because I spent a few minutes looking at this and I spotted something absurdly difficult. And I wrote back to him and said, look, this is what I've spotted. And Melvin quite rightly wrote back and said, that's absurd. Is there anything easier? And I looked at it again and then I spotted something much, much simpler. So I will start by showing you the absurd thing that I spotted. Um, it's quite an interesting pattern and it, resol it revolves around a bent quadruple. Um, so I often find myself when I'm staring at these grids sort of scanning rows and columns and trying to bend round corners to see if I can get um, I can get to something interesting that way. Now here I notice something interesting about column 2. So have a look at column two, see if you can see any opportunities to spot a bent quadruple that sort of majors on column two. And what I noticed was that if we look, look at the numbers one, five, eight, nine, as we come up column two here, this is a one or a nine, this is a one, five, eight or nine, this is a one, five, eight or nine, and this square here is a five or an eight. So there is a bent quadruple on the numbers one, five, eight, nine. Now, in and of itself, I wasn't sure what that meant, so I had to stare at this a bit longer to work out whether or not it was an interesting restriction. And what I noticed was that if we if we just look at this 3x3 three three block, so start here, is it possible that this square and this square just contain the numbers 5 and 8? And clearly it isn't, because if there's a 5 and an 8 in these two positions, that's going to break this square. So we know that these two squares do not contain the numbers 5 and 8. But by identical logic, because of this 1, 9 here, we also know that these two squares cannot contain the numbers 1 and 9, because that's going to break this square. Now, the corollary of all that is that there must be one of the numbers 5 and 8 in these two squares, and one of the numbers 1 and 9 in these two squares. And believe it or not, that's rather helpful because now in this 3x3 three three block, we know that these three squares will have within them a 5, 8 double. And therefore, I can eliminate the numbers 5 and 8 from every other cell in this 3x3 three three block. And look at that. That gives me a 4 here. Um, 
So that was what I, I told Melvin. I think Melvin was a bit taken aback um, because that is not very easy. Um, and there is something far simpler. So now I suggest try and have a look at the uh, three central rows of the grid and see if you can see anything interesting there. We are looking for we're looking for a Y wing. I'll tell you that now. A Y wing is another is a sort of uh, complicated way of saying a bent triple. Uh, and a Y wing in particular is a bent triple where each of the uh, cells involved only is a choice of two numbers. So that's a big help. Um, now here we need to look at this square, which is a five or a six this square which is a 5 or a 9 and this square which is a 6 or a 9. So you can see that we've got a bent triple on the numbers 5, 6 and 9, somewhat easier than this bent quadruple. Um, and with a y-wing what we do is we take the central square of the y-wing and we ask ourselves how this square affects the edges of the y-wing, the wings of the y-wing. You can see if we pick 5 for this square, this square here must be a 6. And if we pick 9 for this square, then this square here has to be a 6. Now one of these things must be true, this square must either be a 5 or a 9, so we know there is definitely a 6 in one of these two squares, either this one or this one. And that means that we can hunt round the grid and if we can find squares that see both this square and this square, they can't possibly contain 6. And look, this square here, it sees this square, and it sees this square. So there cannot be a 6 in this square. We can eliminate that. That gives us a 5. It gives us a 6. And you're off and running and off to the races. So, yeah, I'm sorry about that, Melvin. <laughs> um, but it was an interesting position anyway. And it had a couple of interesting bits of logic in it. Right, finally, let's move on to this. Oh, well, I'd like to move on to this puzzle. Yeah. And I, I forgive me, I'm not sure if this is Jean or if this is Jean. I can't tell from the uh, from the email, but this um, this was a very complicated position. I had to stare at this for some minutes before I spotted anything useful, and even when I did, it was still difficult from then on. Now here we're looking for our old friend, the empty rectangle. Now again, the interesting thing I think about an empty empty rectangle is that it starts from the same premise as an x-wing. So in order to find empty rectangles, there has to be a situation where a single number can only go in two positions, in a row or a column. And here, eventually, I looked at the number 9 in row 9. You can see we have a 9 here and a 9 here. Now, then, after we get this, we have to look for the so-called the empty rectangle. And the empty rectangle is looking at three by three blocks and I'm highlighting the one in question here. And what you're looking for is a situation where the nines in this instance are locked into a single column and a single row, or, or a single row, I should say. So if we look here, you can see that the, the nines in, in question are either in column eight or they're in row 6. I mean, if, if I guess if this was the 9, that both those things are true. But the critical thing is that one of them must be true. And when we find an empty rectangle like this, the critical thing again is that this is pointing down here at this situation where the 9s are locked into exactly two positions. Because this allows us to do some really lovely logic. I, I really like empty rectangles. They're surprisingly common and very powerful. Um, so here, if the nines are in row six, i.e. if either of these nines are true, we could obviously eliminate this nine from this square. So the question is, well, what happens if the, the nines are not in row six, i.e. if they're in column eight? If they're in column eight, the interesting thing is that because this isn't a nine, we still need to place a nine somewhere in row, row 9, so this would have to be the 9. And again, that would eliminate the 9 from this square. So either way, in either of the binary situations that can exist in this 3 by 3 block, we get to eliminate the 9 from this square. Now, even then, this puzzle doesn't collapse, actually. Uh, and what I decided to do at this point was to look at the fact that we have a heck of a lot of squares around the grid that contain the numbers 2 and 9. 
So I wondered what would happen if I picked a 2 into this square. Because you can see I immediately start to back into all of these 2s and 9s. And it's really rather interesting what happens. So if this is 2, obviously this square has to be a 9. Therefore this square will be a 2. Therefore this one will be a 9. Therefore this square will be a 2. Therefore this square will be a 9. Therefore this square will be a 2. Therefore this square will be a 9. And I still need to put a 2 somewhere in column 4. Well, it's going to have to go, therefore, in one of these two positions. But I started the chain by assuming this was a 2. So if I make this a 2, I have a problem, because the implication of this being a 2 is that there is another 2 in this 3x3 three three block, all of which means this is an 8. Now, if you spotted that, well done. That is, I think, um, that's really good logical solving. So anyway, something a bit different today. I hope it was a, an interesting episode. And if you enjoy the channel, please subscribe. We'll be back soon with another edition of Cracking the Cryptic.